Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Brandy Cool, and I'm the director of the Helen Crocker Russell Library at San Francisco Botanical Garden. I'm very happy to welcome you to our event this evening. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to encourage you to use the Q&A feature during the talk. We'll reserve time at the end to answer as many questions as we can. Uh, tonight, we are with Dr. Enrique Salmon, author of Awigara, American Indian Ethnobotanical Traditions and Science. Enrique will be in conversation with Victoria Stewart, Plant Collections Manager here at San Francisco Botanical Garden. I'm excited to welcome you both to speak with us. The bee over there. Thank you. Dr. Enrique Salmon is head of the American Indian Studies Program at California State University, East Bay, in Hayward, California. He has a BS from Western New Mexico University, an MAT in Southwestern Studies from Colorado College, and a PhD in Anthropology from Arizona State University. His own family has always gathered, grown, and used plants for many medicinal and cultural purposes. He feels indigenous cultural concepts of the natural world are only part of a complex and sophisticated understanding of landscapes and biocultural diversity. And he has dedicated his studies to ethnobiology, agroecology, and then ancestral ecological knowledge in order to better understand his own and other perceptions of culture, landscapes, and place. Welcome, Enrique. Thank you. Victoria, Victoria Stewart holds a Master of Science in Biodiversity and Taxonomy of Plants from the University of Edinburgh and Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh and a Bachelor of Arts in Botany from Connecticut College. Prior to her time at San Francisco Botanical Garden, Victoria participated in numerous fellowships and internships at public gardens and herbaria in Massachusetts, California, and the United Kingdom. Welcome, Tori. Thank you. Uh, tonight we will be discussing Enrique's new book, Ewigura which highlights 80 plants revered by North America's indigenous peoples. In the book, Enrique teaches us the way plants are used as food and medicine, the details of their identification and harvest, their important health benefits, plus their role in traditional myths and stories. Now, if you'd like to purchase a copy of the book, it's available at the San Francisco Botanical Garden Bookstore. And Enrique and Tori, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Great, thank you, Brandy. Um, I think Enrique, let's just jump right in. Um, so your book was published by uh, Timber Press in September of last year. It's a beautiful book, uh, the design and the feel of it, but most importantly, the content and its message. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about the making of the book? Um, maybe talk a little bit about the idea of where the book came from? Well, I'd like to take the credit, but um, it was actually, um, one of the editors from, from Timber Press, uh, Stacy Lawrence, they had seen a previous book that I had written, Eating the Landscape, which is about American Indian small scale agriculture. And at the same time, they were wanting to do another ethnobotany sort of book because they had published one before by um, Daniel Mowerman. And it was quite extensive. In fact, I have a copy myself, but it, it's, it reads more like a dictionary. And you know, there's the name of the plant and the tribes that use it, what they use it for and that sort of thing. And they wanted something that had more spirit of the plants. You know, that's when they read my, my other book, it's really a bunch of, of uh, stories that I write about, you know, my experiences with indigenous people in the Southwest and Mexico and other places. And they wanted some more of that. And they really wanted a lot of plants, but I, I told them, well, you know, it's gonna take me a lot longer than the deadline you're giving me if you want, you know, 200 or so plants. And so I suggested, well, why don't I focus on the most important plants to native peoples? And that's when I reached out to my you know, I call my ethnobotanical network and friends and other native peoples that I've worked with and so on and ask them um, to send me 
a list of what they think are the 10 most important plants to their culture or to their geographic region or whatever they decided. And it was from that list that I put together the 80 plants that ended up in the Uyghara. Great, thank you. Um, and you mentioned the uh, title of the book, Iwigara, um, and we'd love to little, uh, learn a little bit more about it. Um, can you tell us where the word comes, uh, excuse me, where the word comes from and what, uh, what the word means to you? Well, it's a word that comes from my people's language, Ramramburi, which is also the name of our language, Ramuri. Other people call us Tarahumara. Um, and Uyghara is a reference towards, I guess you would say, a state of being. That it can also be a verb, depending on the context of when the, the word is used. And the suffix iwi carries a lot of meaning. Iwi, it implies um, overlapping cycles of existence. And it's also spatial temporal. So our, our language is very uh, spatial temporally oriented, whereas your English is very linear. And, um, but also iwi refers to our own unique state of being with, in relationship with everything around us because it kind of means breath or soul or spirit, everything, you know, this, this breath or soul or spirit that we share with everything around us, all the plants, the animals, the rocks and so on, this microphone that's in front of me, you know, we, we all share the, share the same spirit because we come from the same matter of the universe in our way of thinking. And so, you know, when Stacy Lawrence and I, the editor were trying to figure out a name for the book, she had read some of the things I had read and she or written, or written already. And she said, well, why don't we call it Iwigara? It's such a beautiful word. And I thought it was a great idea and that's how we came up with the title. Oh, great. That's, yeah, it's a very interesting uh, concept and, and word. Um, so you're an ethnobotanist um, and in the book you say that people's eyes often glaze over when you define ethnobotany. Um, so I won't ask you for the definition of ethnobotany. We don't want anyone's eyes glazing over. Um, but instead, can you tell us a little bit about your path of becoming an ethnobotanist? Well, as you pointed out, um, or as um, Brandy pointed out earlier, I was raised with um, people who know a lot about plants. Um, my mother, and my grandmother on my mother's side and also my grandfather on my mother's side were all um, very knowledgeable about plants. Um, my grandmother, for example, probably at her height, she probably was familiar with around 300 or so different plants and how to use them for various medicines and spices and foods and whatever. Um, she was always out in her little grass arbor that, you know, grinding herbs or hanging them up in the ceiling and the rafters there or something like that. And so growing up, I just had all this knowledge of plants, how to find them, how to collect them, how to grow them. I didn't think it was anything unusual. And, you know, as I started my, my education, my post-military education in college, every chance I had to choose a topic that I wanted to write, for one of my classes or a research paper, I would connect it somehow to plants and or to native peoples or something like that. And it wasn't until I was finishing my, my um, master's degree at Colorado College and my advisor, you know, was talking to me and she was asking me, well, where are you going to apply for a PhD? And I said, I don't know, where do I apply for a PhD with, you know, with my background? She said, well, you're an ethnobotanist. That was the first time that anyone ever used that, that word in front of me and that title for me. And I realized at that moment, yeah, I am an ethnobotanist. And so I applied to programs that you know, focused on ethnobotany, although there really wasn't any. 
And so I ended up at Arizona State because they were, um, the anthropology department there was flexible enough to let me study the various multidisciplinary nature of ethnobotany because, you know, I'm a botanist, but I'm also an anthropologist. I'm also a phytochemist. Um, what else is there? <laughs> you know, so it's, it's, you know, it's all these different components that comprise how we as ethnobotanists try to study and make sense of the direct interrelationships between plants and people. Yeah, it really, it's such a, a multifaceted uh, discipline. So that's, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, and you start the book with, uh, with a dedication and a Navajo night chant. Um, I think they both really set the context for the book. Um, and can you tell us a little bit more um, about each? Well, um, I was going to use uh, a song from my own people. Um, but, you know, the more I thought about it, you know, as far as uh, a dedication and so on, I was thinking how I really connect to the, the, the Diné or Navajo concept of hojo. Hojo is this, con this word, this, this, this state of being for traditional Navajo where one is in constant, you know, English really doesn't, you know, describe the, the idea well enough, but the closest we can come to it in English is where one is in constant balance and harmony with everything around them. And part of maintaining that balance for traditional Navajo folks are these periodic chant ways. There are these, these ceremonies. And one of the longest ones is the, the, the blessing way ceremony. And then there's also one that's called the night chant, which can last, you know, three to six, sometimes nine days. And the whole point of it is that the, the um, you want to call them the patient, the person who is being served in this ceremony, the whole point is to Main, get them to maintain their connection to their surroundings or to regain that connection, that balance. A lot of times, you know, it happens today when young Navajo soldiers leave and they go fight in Afghanistan or you know, wherever else they, you know, the military may send them. And they're exposed to things outside of their four sacred mountains where things are safe. They're exposed to Chindeh. You know, evil stuff and other, um, I guess, harmful influences. And so they come back. And one of the first things that happens is they, their family puts together and arranges for one of these ceremonies. And this particular chant that I drew these lines from, the night chant, actually goes on for, if, it were, if, if I were to start it right now and start, um, to reciting it and go through the whole ritual in the traditional Navajo way. What time is it? Like six fifteen or so? We'd be here till about uh, six o'clock tomorrow morning because it involves also a lot of sand painting and yebiche dances and so on and other ritual that happens there. But I drew from this one part of the chant because in there it talks about how happily may fair white corn to the ends of the earth come with you. Happily, may fair yellow corn to the ends of the earth come with you. And then blue corn, and then all corn. And then at the last line of this segment anyway, happily may fair plants of all kind to the ends of the earth come with you. And whenever I see that, it just really strikes a, a chord with me because it really epitomizes for a lot of native peoples, not just Navajo folks, the importance of plants in our, our identities, our sense of morals, um, our, our entire culture. 
Um, because oftentimes for indigenous people, it was plants that brought us to this place that we are now, helped us in the emergence into this world. Our Navajo folks, during the origin times, there was a point when, I'm not gonna tell the whole story because that'll take another hour or so, but there was a point when um, the first animals helped, or had to, had to talk to Father Sky and Mother Earth to bring the world back into existence. And part of that process involved um, these four sacred plants, one of which was corn. And so, you know, I can go on for the rest of our time here about just that night chant. It's pretty incredible, all the, the layers of, of meaning that can be derived um, from that chant. Great. Um, and so there must be like hundreds of plants used by North American Native peoples for food, medicine, clothes, crafts, all, all sorts of different things. Um, and you know, you mentioned at the beginning that you weren't really going to make an encyclopedia of plants with this book. Um, so how did your book, um, you landed on 80, 80 specific plants and how did you, um, how did you arrive at that list? Um, what were what was the sort of the criteria and things that went into deciding these these 80, 80 plants? Well, like I said earlier, you know, I, I um, asked my ethnobotanical network and other folks that I know, native folks, to send me that list. But even then, you know, there were I could have you know come up with a, a couple hundred plants from just the the list of ten plants that that people gave me. Of course, some of them had to. Go overboard and they sent me 20 plants or so or you know um and so i had to try to you know if you know if you have the book you notice i tried to have a sort of fair representation of all the different geographic and cultural areas around north america and i tried to also have a good sort of mixing of you know, medicinal and food plants and other plants that, you know, come in handy for perhaps you know, making canoes or, you know, I even throw in there, um, you know, I'll talk about maple and how I use big leaf maple for making instruments sometimes. And, and so I just really, really wanted to have a good mixing of different kinds of, of plants. And so that's where I came up with the 80. Yeah, and the, there is a, such a, a breadth of uh, of plants and where they come from across the across the continent. Um, and, yeah, and because one... a lot of people, um, when they hear the word ethnobotany, they think of the kind of stuff that you know people like myself do. Uh, most people focus on medicinal plants, and that's a part of it, obviously. But you know, for native people, plants, you know, they're more than just medicines, and they're part of the of the, you know, the scope of the book is to try to get people to recognize that there's, you know, there's these really complex and sophisticated scope of ethnobotanical knowledge that exists still today among indigenous peoples. You know, I always get in my students' cases when they talk about how this tribe used to use this plant and used to use this plant. And I always have to write back to them, no, we're still here. We're still using these plants. Yeah, it's a medicine and food. That tends to be the sort of the initial initial thought process. So yeah, that's um, seeing all those different things they can do is really really fascinating. Um, and in the opening, uh, one of the opening sections of the book uh, is called "All Native Knowledge Is Local." Um, and in it, you talk about North American Native people's origin stories, um, their relationship with plants, and how specific culture is tied to an ecosystem and a geographic region. Um, I was really moved um, when reading these regional stories of uh, the plants and their interconnectedness with people and all living things. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about um, our region, the, the West Coast? Well, uh, more specifically, what do you want to hear? Um, just a little bit about uh, the, uh, the plants in this region and um, the native peoples, their, their connection um, with the plants in this region. So just... A very broad question, but. Well, where to begin? <laughs> because 
here on the California coast, especially, you know, all the way up into the Washington and British, British Columbia regions, um, was in North America before Europeans showed up, the most heavily populated region in North America. Um, of all the indigenous peoples in North America before Europeans arrived, 30, no one knows for sure, but it was at least 36%, you know, somewhere in there of them lived here on the West Coast. And partly because it's, it's such a cornucopia here of, of edible plants, medicinal plants, you know, it's a paradise here. It still is. And imagine now before Europeans arrived and indigenous peoples, you know, Kumeyaay, Pai Pai, Chumash, you can move up the coast, you know, Veselian and then Yurok and Chochenyo Ohlone and so on, managing this entire region like a huge garden. And, you know, we've been hearing more about the, that today with the advent of larger and more destructive wildfires in which, you know, California always burned but indigenous peoples managed it to the point where the fires were small scale. They were not as destructive and were actually more beneficial to just the, the literally the hundreds of varieties of useful plants. And if I had to pick just a couple of, of important plants to California natives, for example, one of the first ones, of course, would have to be oak trees you know, valley oaks and red oaks and live oaks and more specifically the acorns that are produced from the, the oak trees that are long time a staple food for, for California people and how they were managed um, in such a way that there were, there were actually fewer oak trees than there are today, but each tree produced more acorns because of the way they were managed, because of the small scale burning, which reduced the competition for nutrients and moisture around the bases of the oak trees. And then the periodic pruning of the oak trees that mostly native women did, which in the long run actually produced more acorns. Um, another plant that comes to mind that a lot of people don't often think of is the different kinds of what in the book we refer to as Indian hemp, but is uh, different kinds of milkweeds, the pocketum. And mostly used for their fibers. And during the year, um, they were allowed to grow until the fall and then they would be harvested and cut down. So imagine, you know, this is the, the level of the ground. The, the, they would be cut down to about this high, you know, to the ground. But what, what that did is that the following year, the, the Indian hemp would grow, but they would grow straight. And if you ever go look at, you know, a lot of Indian hemp growing today or different kinds of milkweeds and they're not being taken care of, they grow in all sorts of different directions. But you want the stems to be growing straight so that when you collect them for fibers, the fibers are nice and long and strong. And they can be um, easily manipulated into a string and then to different kinds of ropes. But more importantly, here in the West Coast, especially the north, northern west coast of California, made into miles and miles of, of fishing nets that would stretch part way into you know, the Pitt River, the Klamath or even you know, the Sacramento and so on um, for catching salmon. You know, different, seven times out of the year, there were, different, there were seven runs of different kinds of salmon that used to come up in the Northern coast. And so um, after acorn salmon here in Northern California would be an important food and plants like Indian hemp played a role in helping them to harvest some the salmon. Um, tule would be another important one another important plant around here. I was just doing some exploratory fly fishing <laughs> over by Pleasanton along the Royal de la Laguna. 
And I was, you know, I was very happy to see down along the banks of the, the oil there, all these different kinds of tule, which can again be made to clothing, to for you know fibers into making rope, into making into boats, for example. Housing is another use of tule. So those are just some of the um, ones that come to mind first. I can go on and on and on with all these different kinds of plants. And California is just incredible. If one's an ethnobotanist or just a botanist in general, this is a great place to be. Definitely. Um, and that actually, that leads us into uh, my next question perfectly. Um, so you said you could go on and on about uh, different plants. So um, there, there are so many, uh, so many really interesting stories um, in the book about the, the various plants. And I, it's probably very hard to choose which ones your favorites are. But uh, if you could pick uh, five or so that are your, your favorite, favorite plant profiles in the book that have sort of the most interesting from, you know, across, the, across North America, um, which ones, which ones speak to you the most, would you say? Well, um, I want to proceed my answer by pointing out that when I wrote the book, you know, I, I tried to bring the plants to life. I tried to, you know, um, help their spirit emerge on the pages. And you know? so a lot of the, a lot of the, the plant entries begin with stories because stories is one of the best way to transfer knowledge and to create connections among people because everyone, no matter the story, can always find some kind of connection to whatever story they're hearing. And, and so when I think of that, one of my favorite ones is stinging nettle because I can't help um, when I think about stinging nettle at the same time thinking about Roosevelt Elks <laughs> Why is that? Well, because I was backpacking up in the, the Lost Coast Wilderness once, and I was, if you've ever been there, you know, a lot of the trail does a lot of this dipping and so on, and you had to, sometimes you dip down into a creek, you know, you had to cross the creek. And so I was crossing this little creek, and my friend that was with me, just, just as I was getting to the other side, you know, my friend said, stop. And I froze, you know, mid creek, <laughs> and and I looked up, and maybe about three feet in front of me was the snout of a big giant elk, and the sitter looking at me chewing on stinging nettles, <laughs> and so first, you know, first lesson was I really got a close up view of what the snout of a Roosevelt elk looks like, <laughs> but also I learned. They like stinging nettles, <laughs> and because he was just you know chewing away, and I backed up quietly and let the let the elk chew away. Um, stinging nettles are a great plant, and just like they sound, you know, if you if you touch upon them, they the little thorns or spines, whatever you want to call them, they'll stick, they'll send a little um, toxin into your skin, and that's what causes the stinging sensation. But a lot of folks don't realize that they're a great green, you know, for eating. Um, you collect the the young, the young um, shoots, young leaves. You can quickly boil them, and the the spines, the stinging spines, disappear. And they're really tasty, and they're just great, you know, full of um, polyphenols, antioxidants, and and soluble and soluble fibers and so on. Um, just a great all around food. And they also have some medicinal benefit as well you know, for urinary tract infections and so on. So this is a great plant to, to, to collect and you know, they're best collected in the wild. In fact, when I was down there by Pleasanton the other day, there were some stinging nettles that I had to be careful around. You know, I was coming close to you know, having to climb out of the old oil and almost got my hand stung uh, different nettles there. Um, another favorite plant? Man, that's hard to choose. Um, of course, there's, there's corn. My people believe that we emerged into this world as a result of these two children 
who survived the flood and were given these new seeds by um, a, a bean to plant as the flood waters receded. And in the moist ground, the moist soil, the children planted these new seeds and sprouting from these seeds were these new plants these children had never seen before. After a while, the children were watching these plants one day and emerging from the center of stock of this big grass-like plants were this, this sort of fruit. And then after a while, he noticed these heads and then arms coming out of, of what you would call corn, you know, maize. We call it sunuki. And the current version, if you want to call it that, of my people, we emerge from ears of corn. We are literally the children of corn. And so corn is always a special a special plant for, for me and for my people. When we eat corn, when we drink this alcoholic beverage that we made from make from corn, we reactivate, we revitalize our origins. It's like a, a sacrament when we eat corn and when we, we drink the corn beer. And so not only is it a good food for all sorts of different kinds of things, um, it also has medicinal benefits as again. And, and so especially the when the the corn the, the corn ears of corn are growing and you see the kind of reddish tassels coming out of the, the corn, you can actually collect those and make a really refreshing drink. Um, you can also, that drink comes in really handy for stomach problems and kind of settles the stomach. It's good for sore throats. Again, for kidney problems and so on, it helps balance the liver and it helps to reduce um, um, cholesterol you know, the, L, the LDL sort of cholesterol in the body. So it's just a, a good all around food besides just putting butter on it and eating it straight on corn on the cob sort of thing. Um, other plants. Another one that I really got a kick out of when I was researching for this plant. Um, one of the people that I I talked with one of the indigenous peoples it was a, a woman named Judy Dow. She lives up in Vermont. She's Abenaki, Mayangunkian speaking peoples from up there in, in Vermont. And she kind of surprised me with her list because a lot of the list included berries and especially blueberries. And <clears throat> Like a lot of people today, I was, you know, I think of blueberries as something you kind of add to your pancakes on Sunday morning, perhaps. And I like to make blue cornmeal pancakes and I add blueberries. And, you know, maybe you put blueberries on ice cream or something like that. But Judy um, introduced me to all these other benefits of blueberries. You know, the juices of blueberry, for example, is really good for skin problems like eczema and psoriasis. And again, it's full of antioxidants and different important polyphenols. But then blueberry bushes um, have a really important value for Algonquian speaking people up in New England, because like I explained earlier with Indian hemp, they will manage the bushes in the fall when they prune them, they coppice them down to just a couple of inches above the ground so that Next year, they grow really straight strand stems. And blueberry stems are really good for making traditional baskets. And the baskets can, are woven so tightly they can hold water. You can cook in these baskets if you know what you're doing. Um, so anyway, that's another one of my, my favorite plants from the that's, book. Yeah, that's, wonderful. That's, uh, I'm, that's from my neck of the woods. So it's always, always interesting to hear about the native uh, uses in New England. Um, and I think we have time for uh, one more question from you before we open up uh, the questions to the audience. Um, and I just wanted to ask you, um, what are you hoping this book um, inspires in people? I think it's uh, the first thing is 
for people to develop an awareness of their relationship to plants and how important that relationship is. I think a lot of times we take for granted um, in our modern society how much we rely on plants. And I like for people to, if anything, when they, they read the book and look at some of the plant entries to first go, oh, I didn't know that about that plant. And then secondly, to try to explore more about some of the plants that maybe aren't in the book or to take a plant that they thought they were familiar with and to maybe learn some more from one of the things that I wrote and then to go deeper into you know, their relationship with a couple of these plants. Because I think when we wear, raise that kind of awareness where we realize how we are intertwined with the plants around us, then we start to assume the role of, of steward of the plants around us. It doesn't have to be all the plants in North America, it can be just the plants in, that, you, that are around you in Mill Valley or that are around you in Oakland or wherever you happen to live and to play a stewardship sort of role with our environments like that. Because as I mentioned in the book, all indigenous knowledge is local. And that means for us, we can start to become indigenous to the Bay Area here by becoming more familiar with you know, local, local knowledge that we can garner from the plants around us. Wonderful. Well, I think it definitely will uh, inspire more people to get in touch with the plants in their communities. And um, thank you so much. I think uh, at this point, we're gonna open it up to questions. We have some already in the Q and A, um, but like Brandy said in the beginning, please feel free to type in your questions and we have some more time to go through them all. Um, so we had some, uh, someone ask, um, did the native Californians use uh, poison oak at all? Um, and if so, how did they use it? You have to really be careful with poison oak. Um, that same toxin that you want to, you want to call it, that the oils that come out of poison oak that cause us to develop the, the rash. Um, again, with a knowledgeable herbalist can be used for um, mending really bad bruises because um, again, you know, you have to really be careful with what you're doing because you can harm yourself, but you know, it, you can cause, you can, uh, heal your know, really bad bruises. We're talking like really deep kind of bruises, not like a little superficial kind of one. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's that's the only remedy that I can come up with at the, you know, off the cuff right now. I know there's a couple others, but they're not coming to mind. I sort of, I tend to stay away from, from poison oak because I'm really um, allergic to it. And so when I see it, I give it a wide berth. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you there, I steer, steer very clear. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have another question. Uh, how do we uh, commute with plants to hear their needs better, um, to listen to the lessons that they share? Well, that goes back to that awareness. Um, one of my favorite assignments that I give to my students is I'll ask them, um, it depends on the class that I'm teaching, of course, but there's this one class where I'll ask them to go to the same spot, wherever they happen to live, somewhere nearby. It could even be their own backyard. But to go to that spot and at the same time of day, once a week, you know, for the whole semester, and you just sit. And depending on the class, I'll ask them to watch either a sunrise or a sunset, and then to journal about what they've experience for 20 minutes. But with my ethnobotany class, I'll ask them sometimes, well, just sit at a place where there's a tree or bushes or specific plants and just be with those plants for 20 minutes or so. And then just be aware of what's, what's going on. And at first they're wondering why Dr. Samoan is giving him this weird assignment. But then by around the third week or so, 
I start noticing their journals that they write every week. Their, their awareness, their attention is expanding. And they're seeing more of what's going on with the plants as they change it, as they react to light or shadows or to insects and even certain animals coming and visiting the plants. And by doing that, um, we become intimate with just a, one plant or a handful of plants, but then from there, we can expand that intimacy and become more in relation with everything around us. And so that's one place to start. Another thing I'll tell people is, if you're not a gardener, well, this year, grow jalapenos. And then watch what those jalapenos need. And then um, next year, grow another variety of jalapenos. Or maybe add tomatoes and just pay attention to the needs of those plants. And that's another way of becoming aware and knowledgeable about plants. Great. Um, someone else asked if you could uh, if you could speak a little bit about Ceanothus um, and its uses, um, like specifically with uh, Native peoples from around the Bay Area. Um, well, there's different varieties. Ceanothus. That's what I'm, I'm assuming that they're talking about. And in the book, anyway, I talk about uh, Ceanothus fenleri, which is uh, red root. Um, the root, just like it sounds, is, is, you know, it has a reddish sort of color on the, on the outside of it. And it's really good, you know, made into a, a, a decoction, so to speak, like a tea. And for sore throats, it has a lot, lot of naturally occurring antibacterial qualities. And so all the genus of Ceoanthus, the roots of the genus of Ceoanthus have the similar or same quality. Some have a little less than others. And some like Fenlery has more. And you know, talking about the Navajo chant ways, for example, all those, the singers, the chanters are going on for literally days. And every now and then they'll stop to gargle with some of the red root to help the, you know, um, reduce the inflammation that's happening in the throats, which is another use of coanthus. It reduces inflammation in the body as well, both internally and externally. So both the root, the bark, and to a lesser extent, the leaves of coanthus has value for that. Very interesting. Um, we've had a couple different questions um, regarding uh, fungi and mushrooms. Um, and are there different mushrooms that um, are used for medicine or food? Um, I mean, I know we use them culinarily, but um, different ones that you speak on in the book at all? No, I'm, um, as I joke, I'm not a mushroomologist <laughs> or a my mycologist. Um, and I, you know, like, like, uh, Poison oak, I stay clear of mushrooms for the most part because you know, I'd never really um, learned about mushrooms. It wasn't part of my people's culture, although some of my people do collect wild mushrooms, but I didn't grow up with that. And I just never really went there when it comes to studying mushrooms. I know there's a lot of edible mushrooms in, in the Bay Area, but again, um, don't ask me to yep, tell no, which ones are useful. <laughs> not, not a mycologist, so I get it. <laughs> um, we had another question uh, asking if Native peoples, as plants have started to be introduced um, in various different ways, if Native peoples have started um, finding uses and in incorporating these introduced plants um, into their lives and practices and things. Ask that question again, please. Sorry, so um, like as plants are introduced from other places, um, you know, whether they're um, just introduced or invasive or things like that, um, have native peoples found uses um, for these uh, introduced plants? Oh, yeah. Um, I can think of one from my own culture's background. Um, Europeans first showed up in our region down in, in, the, in the Sierra Madres, the Sierra Tarahumara, Chihuahua, Mexico, about 1609, <clears throat> and then 
quickly and the missionaries came, some, similar to what happened here in California and in New Mexico as well. And they brought a lot of their own favorite plants. One of them was in Latin, if you speak Latin, it was Ricinus communis or castor bean plant. And, you know, we, a lot of people think of it as a poisonous plant, but literally you can take the oils out of the, the beans there and it has some beneficial uses and so on. And same for my people. It's, you know, it's not a plant native to North America. And my people use it for, um, you can take the oil, and there's a whole process of getting the oil from the beans. But um, again, you know, I don't recommend people to do this unless you really, really you know, know about how to how to process plants and are very knowledgeable because it can it's a very dangerous plant. It has a lot of uh, has ricin, for example, an alkaloid that is very, very toxic. But externally, you can take the oil and it comes in handy for insomnia. And you know, you know, drink it, what happens is you you rub it you know, on your, your temples and so on, and it helps you know, to calm down and fall asleep. Um, the glycosides and the alkaloids in Ricinus communis literally cause red blood cells to, um, on a molecular level, to pop open, to literally kind of explode, which is why I don't want to take it internally, but externally, <laughs> that can come in handy for, you know, or injuries, you know, like if you have a sprained wrist or ankle or something like that, it comes in handy for helping to, to heal that, uh, that inflammation on the, in the bone and in the, the tendons, for example. Um, so yeah, this is, and also my people make these incredible necklaces out of the beans, because if you've ever seen castor beans, they're, they're these speckled sort of a look to them and they really make amazing necklaces <laughs> and you mix them with Job's tears and, and other other plant seeds and so on. Very interesting. Um, so someone else asked um, how can we uh, what more can we do to sort of share this knowledge and how is it being sort of passed down to that next generation and to young people I mean obviously um, there's Formal, formal education, um, like in the classes you teach and whatnot, but how, are, how is this knowledge being shared with, uh, with young people? I think the best thing is what we're seeing happening right now during this pandemic, we're seeing a lot more outdoor education springing up everywhere. And that's, that's the best way to teach children, especially about their relationship to plants, just getting them out there among plants. Um, that's how I learned. And it's not like my, you know, my elders, you know, once a week sat me down and said, let's learn about this plant today. <laughs> well, what happened is it was just in the process of what we used to call in, in the military on the job training. <laughs> you just learn by being and doing. And so I learned by being with my grandmother, my mother, for example, as we harvested plants, as we went out into the the woods and collected plants. I learned from my grandfather as I would help him in our cornfields and in his his um, his fruit trees. And we would he would sit down in the hottest part of day and he would just tell little short stories about plants. And we were outside among the plants and as we was telling these stories. And so just getting children out among plants and to make it in a way so that it's not so structured. Um, you know, the best way to kill children's learning about nature, about the outside, about ecology, about plants is to structure it. You want to do it in a way so that it's, the learning is done where it doesn't seem like they're learning, if that makes sense. <laughs> um, yeah, because you can talk and I'll tell you are blue in the face, you can have children read things you know, forever and ever, but until they're out there learning and hearing stories about the plants and telling their own stories about the plants, then um, they're not going to learn anything. Great. And I think we have time for um, one more question. And one of our uh, 
local audience members um, mentioned that you know plants have been such a such a source of comfort and for people during uh, the pandemic. And is there any um, suggestions for resources um, from you about um, Bay Area plants in particular? Um, hmm. and What's that one publisher? Um, there's one publisher here in the Bay Area. I can't think. I know the guy's last name is Margulis. And God, it's, it escapes me right now. Um, I'm sorry about that. Um, um, Florence Shipbeck has written a lot about plants in the southern part of California. Okay. Um, Yeah, I'm trying to think of what else. The, another good resource is the Cultural Conservancy. They've been doing a lot, especially in Marin, with, uh, with native plants as, uh, as well. Um, yeah, I, that's really a tough one there. <laughs> well, you know, we'll say the West Coast section of, uh, of your book, any of the plants listed <laughs> under the West Coast. So, <laughs> yeah. um, all right, well, I think that's all the time we have for questions. I just wanna say thank you so much. This has been um, so very interesting. Um, really great to learn more about, um, more about your book. And I think I'm gonna turn it back over uh, to Brandy just to close us out. Thank you again. Thank you, Enrique, uh, for sharing your knowledge and time with us tonight. Your book is just beautiful. Uh, I know I have a hard time putting it down. Um, and thank you, Tori. Can I just jump back in really quick? We had a few folks write in that it was Heyday Press uh, has a lot of, that's the, the, pub, the publisher you're the gig of. So thank you to everyone who, uh, who caught that. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> that, that's what I was thinking of. <laughs> to you, Brandy. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. And I hope that you all see it. We'll see you at the Botanical Garden soon. And I just wanted to say that we, our next author event is on April 21st. It's, um, you can join us with award-winning photographer Saxon Holt and his new book, Gardening in Summer Dry Climate. So I hope to see you guys then. Thank you again, Enrique, so much for joining us. It was wonderful. And thank you so much, Tori. Adios, Siba. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.